I'll be reading these to you. There will also be copies in the uh, jury room for you to use. So this will not be the only time you'll be able to look at them. All right. In the Iowa District Court for Chickasaw County, the state of Iowa versus Cheyenne Harris, FECR 011491, instructions to the jury. The court submits the following instructions to the jury. Instruction number one, the trial information charges the defendant Cheyenne Harris with one count of murder in the first degree and one count of child endangerment causing death. Count one includes the lesser included offenses of murder in the second degree and involuntary manslaughter. Count two includes the lesser included offenses of child endangerment causing serious injury, child endangerment causing bodily injury, and child endangerment. Two. Cheyenne Harris has entered a plea of not guilty. The plea of not guilty is a complete denial of the charges and places the burden on the state to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Whenever I instruct you the state must prove something, it must be by evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. If the state does not prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, your verdict must be not guilty. <clears throat> Instruction number three. The trial information is a document that formally charges a defendant with a crime and is merely the method by which the defendant is brought into court for trial. It is not evidence. Number four, Cheyenne Harris is presumed innocent and not guilty. This presumption of innocence requires you to put aside all suspicion which might arise from the arrest, charge, or the present situation of the defendant. The presumption of innocence remains with the defendant throughout the trial unless the evidence establishes guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Five, you shall base your verdict only upon the evidence in these instructions. Evidence is testimony in person or by deposition. Exhibits received by the court. You may examine the exhibits closely, but be careful not to alter or destroy them. Stipulations, which are agreements between the attorneys. Facts may be proved by direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, or a combination of both. Sometimes during a trial, references are made to pretrial statements and reports, court filings, witnesses' depositions, or other miscellaneous items. Only those things formally offered and received by the court are available to you during your deliberations. Documents or items read from or referred to which were not offered and received into evidence are not available to you. The following are not evidence. Statements, arguments, questions, and comments by the lawyers. <coughs> Excuse me. Objections and rulings on objections, any testimony I told you to disregard, and anything you saw or heard about this case outside the courtroom. Instruction number six. In considering the evidence, make deductions and reach conclusions according to reason and common sense. Facts may be proved by direct evidence, circumstantial evidence, or both. Direct evidence is evidence from a witness who claims actual knowledge of a fact, such as an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence is evidence about a chain of facts which show a defendant is guilty or not guilty. The law makes no distinction between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. Give all the evidence the weight and value you think it is entitled to receive. As you consider the evidence, do not be influenced by any personal sympathy, bias, prejudices, or emotions. Because you are making very important decisions in this case, you are to evaluate the evidence carefully and avoid decisions based on generalizations gut feelings, prejudices, sympathies, stereotypes, or biases. The law demands that you return a just verdict based solely on the evidence, your reason and common sense, and these instructions. As jurors, your sole duty is to find the truth and do justice. Reach your verdict without discrimination. In reaching your verdict, you must not consider the defendant's race, color, religious beliefs, national origin, or sex. You are not to return a verdict for or against the defendant unless you would return the same verdict without regard to her race, color, religious belief, national origin, or sex. Seven, decide the facts from the evidence. Consider the evidence using your observations, common sense, and experience. Try to reconcile any conflicts in the evidence, but if you cannot, accept the evidence you find more believable. In determining the facts, you may have to decide what testimony you believe. You may believe all, part, or none of any witness's testimony. There are many factors which you may consider in deciding what testimony to believe. For example, whether the testimony is reasonable and consistent with other evidence you believe, whether a witness has made inconsistent statements, the witness's appearance, conduct, age, intelligence, memory, and knowledge of the facts, the witness's interest in the trial, their motive, candor, bias, and prejudice. Instruction number 8. 
8. You must determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty from the evidence and the law in these instructions. You must consider all of the instructions together. The one instruction includes all of the applicable law. 9. Nothing I have said or done during the trial was intended to give any opinion as to the facts, proof, or what your verdict should be. 10. The burden is on the state to prove Cheyenne Harris guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is one that fairly and naturally arises from the evidence in the case or from the lack or failure of evidence produced by the state. A reasonable doubt is a doubt based upon reason and common sense, the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt, therefore, must be proof of such a convincing character that a reasonable person would not hesitate to rely and act upon it. However, proof beyond a reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond all possible doubt. If, after a full and fair consideration of all the evidence, you are firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, then you have no reasonable doubt and you should find the defendant guilty. But if, after a full and fair consideration of all the evidence in the case, or from the lack or failure of evidence produced by the state, you are the duty of if the defendant is guilty or not guilty. In the event of a guilty verdict, you have nothing to do with punishment. 12. Prior sworn testimony from Zachary Cohn was read into the record. This testimony was taken under oath before the trial and preserved in writing. Consider that testimony as if it had been given live in court. 13. In this case, the defendant did not testify. The defendant is not required to testify, and no inference of guilt shall be drawn from that fact. The burden of proof remains upon the state to prove the guilt of the defendant. 14. To commit a crime, a person must intend to do an act which is against the law. While it is not necessary that a person knows the act is against the law, it is necessary that the person was aware he was doing the act, and he did it voluntarily, not by mistake or accident. You may, but are not required to conclude a person intends the natural results of his acts. 15. Serious injury is a condition which cripples, incapacitates, weakens, or destroys a person's normal mental functions, or a bodily injury which creates a substantial risk of death. 16. Bodily injury means physical pain, illness, or any impairment of a physical condition. <clears throat> 17. The Marshal Instruction. Under Count 1, the state must prove all of the following elements of murder in the first degree. 1. And during the time frame of August 4, 2017, through and including August 30, 2017, the defendant killed S.K. 2. S.K. was under the age of 14. 3. The defendant did so with malice of forethought. 4. The defendant was committing the offense of child endangerment, as defined in Instruction Number 21. 5. S.K.'s death occurred under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to human life. If the state has proven all of the elements, the defendant is guilty of murder in the first degree. If the state has failed to prove any one of the elements, the defendant is not guilty of murder in the first degree, and you will consider the charge of murder in the second degree explained in instruction number 23. 18. As to element number 3 of instruction number 17, malice is a state of mind which leads one to intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of another in disregard of the rights of another out of actual hatred or with an evil or unlawful purpose. Malice may be established by evidence of actual hatred or by proof of a deliberate or fixed intent to do an injury. Malice may be found from the acts and conduct of the defendant and the means used in doing the wrongful and injurious act. Malice of forethought is a fixed purpose or a design to do some physical harm to another which exists before the act is committed. It does not have to exist for any particular length of time. 19. Malice may but need not be inferred from the commission of child endangerment resulting in death. 20. Concerning instruction number 1 of instruction number 17 and instruction number 22, the defendant killed S.K. if her actions caused or directly contributed to S.K.'s death. 
and 21. Concerning element number four of instruction number 17, the defendant committed child endangerment if she, as the parent of SK, intentionally committed an act or a series of acts using torture or cruelty that resulted in bodily injury to SK. 22. State must prove all of the following elements of murder in the second degree. Between August 4, 2017 and August 30, 2017, the defendant killed SK. 2. The defendant acted with malice of forethought. If the defendant has proved all of the elements, the defendant is guilty of murder in the second degree. If the state has failed to prove any one of the elements, the defendant is not guilty of murder in the second degree, and you will then consider the charge of involuntary manslaughter explained in instruction number 23. No matter how many times I proofread these, when I read them out loud, I always find typos, so I, I'm seeing them too, so I apologize, all right? Instruction number 23, the state must prove all of the following elements of involuntary manslaughter. One, between the fourth day of August 2017 and the 30th day of August 2017, the defendant recklessly committed a series of acts using torture or cruelty that resulted in bodily injury to SK. The defendant did the act in a manner likely to cause death or serious injury to the child. By doing the act, the defendant unintentionally caused the death of SK. The state has proved all of the elements. The defendant is guilty of involuntary manslaughter. The state has failed to prove any one of the elements. The defendant is not guilty of involuntary manslaughter. And you will consider the charge of child endangerment causing death in count two, explained in instruction number 24. 24. Under count two, the state must prove the following elements of child endangerment causing death. Between the dates of August 4, 2017 and August 30, 2017, the defendant was the mother of SK. Two, SK was under the age of 14 years. Three, the defendant willfully deprived SK of the necessary food, water, health care, or supervision appropriate for a child of SK's age. Four, the defendant was reasonably able to provide food, water, health care, or supervision to SK. Five, as a result, SK suffered substantial physical harm. Six, SK died as a result of the substantial physical harm. If the state has proved all of the elements, the defendant is guilty of child endangerment causing the death of a child. If the state has failed to prove any one of the elements, the defendant is not guilty of child endangerment causing the death of a child, and you will consider the charge of child endangerment causing serious injury, explained in instruction number 25. 25. The state must prove all the following elements of child endangerment causing serious injury. Between August 4, 2017 and August 30, 2017, the defendant was the mother of SK. SK was under the age of 14 years. 3. The defendant willfully deprived SK of the necessary food, water, health, care, or supervision appropriate for a child of SK's age. Four, the defendant's act resulted in serious injury to SK. The state has proved all of the elements the defendant is guilty of child endangerment causing serious injury. The state has failed to prove any one of the elements the defendant is not guilty of child endangerment causing serious injury, and you will then consider the crime of child endangerment causing bodily injury as explained in instruction 26. 26. The state must prove all of the following elements of child endangerment causing bodily injury. Between August 4, 2017 and August 30, 2017, the defendant was the mother of SK. 2. SK was under the age of 14 years. 3. The defendant willfully deprived SK of the necessary food, water, health care, or supervision appropriate for a child of SK's age. 4. The defendant's act resulted in bodily injury to SK. If the state has proved all of the elements, the defendant is guilty of child endangerment causing bodily injury. The state has failed to prove any one of the elements. The defendant is not guilty of child endangerment causing bodily injury, and you will consider the crime of child endangerment as explained in Instruction 27. 27. The state must prove all of the following elements of child endangerment. 1. Between August 4, 2017 and August 30, 2017, the defendant was the mother of SK. 2. SK was under the age of 14 years. Three, the defendant willfully deprived SK of the necessary food, water, health care, or supervision appropriate for a child of SK's age. If the defendant, <clears throat> excuse me, if the state has proved all the elements, 
The defendant is guilty of child endangerment. If the state has failed to prove any one of the elements, the defendant is not guilty of child endangerment. 28. As used in paragraph 1 of instruction number 23, a person is reckless or acts recklessly when the person willfully disregards the safety of persons. It is more than a lack of reasonable care which may cause unintentional injury. Recklessness is conduct which is consciously done with willful disregard of the consequences. For recklessness to exist, the act must be highly dangerous. In addition, the danger must be so obvious that the actor knows or should reasonably foresee that harm will more likely than not result from the act. The recklessness is willful. It is not intentional in the sense that harm is intended to result. 29. If there is a reasonable doubt as to the degree of the crime, the defendant shall only be convicted of the degree for which there is no reasonable doubt. 30. You have heard testimony from persons described as experts, persons who have become, become experts in a field because of their education and experience may give their opinion on matters in that field and the reasons for their opinion. Consider expert testimony just like any other testimony. You may accept it or reject it. You may give it as much weight as you think it deserves. Considering the witness's education and experience, the reasons given for the opinion, and all the other evidence in the case. 31. You've heard evidence claiming some witnesses made statements before the trial while under oath which were inconsistent with what they said in this trial. If you find these statements were made and were inconsistent, then you may consider them as part of the evidence just as if they had been made at this trial. You may also use these statements to help you decide if you believe the witnesses. You may disregard all or any part of the testimony if you find the statements were made and were not consistent with the testimony given at trial, but you are not required to do so. Do not disregard the trial testimony if other evidence you believe supports it, or you believe it for any other reason. 32. Evidence has been offered to show that the defendant made statements at an earlier time and place. If you find any of the statements were made, then you may consider them as part of the evidence. Statements and questions by law enforcement officers during interviews with the defendant are not evidence to be considered for their truth. The defendant's answers and responses to those questions and statements are evidence. 33. The defendant has been charged with two counts, including lesser offenses of each count. This is just a method for bringing each of the charges to trial. If you find the defendant guilty or not guilty on one of the counts, you are not to conclude the defendant is guilty or not guilty on the other. You must determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty separately on each count. 34. Where two or more alternative theories are presented, <clears throat> or where two or more facts would produce the same result, the law does not require each juror to agree as to which theory or fact leads to his or her verdict. It is the verdict itself which must be unanimous, not the theory or facts upon which it is based. 35. Defendant's purpose in offering the testimony of Dr. O'Hara was not in furtherance of a claim she was insane or incapable of forming a specific intent to commit a particular offense in August of 2017. You may consider the testimony in determining whether she was aware she was doing an act and whether she did it voluntarily, not by mistake or accident. 37. During the trial, you've been allowed to take notes. You may take these notes with you to the jury room to use in your deliberations. Remember, these are notes and not evidence. Generally, they reflect the recollection or impressions of the evidence as viewed by the person taking them and may be inaccurate or incomplete. Upon reaching a verdict, leave the notes in the jury room and they will be destroyed. When you begin your deliberations, you should select a foreman or forewoman. He or she shall see that your deliberations are carried on in an orderly manner, that the issues are fully and freely discussed, and that every juror is given an opportunity to express his or her views. In order to return a verdict, each juror must agree to it. Your verdict must be unanimous. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and reach an agreement, if you can do so without compromising your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with the other jurors. During your deliberations, do not hesitate to re-examine your view and change your opinion if convinced it is wrong. 
But do not change your opinion as to the weight or effect of the evidence just because it is the opinion of the other jurors or for the mere purpose of returning a verdict. Remember, you are the judges of the facts. Your sole duty is to find the truth and do justice. 39. Occasionally after a jury retires to the jury room, the members have questions. Usually questions about instructions can be answered by carefully rereading them. If, however, any of you feels it necessary to ask a question, you must do so in writing and deliver, deliver the question to the court attendant. I cannot communicate with you <clears throat> without first discussing your question and potential answer with the parties and the lawyers. This process naturally takes considerable time to assemble the parties <clears throat> excuse me, and lawyers before I can reply. Keep the question and response and return it to the court with the verdict. You will soon be discussing the case among yourselves. However, you are still prohibited from communicating about this case with anyone outside the jury room before reaching your verdict. <clears throat> this includes cell phones and electronic media such as text messages, Facebook, Twitter, email, etc. Do not do any research or make any investigation about this case on your own. Do not use Internet Maps or Google Earth or any other program or device to search for or to view any place discussed in the testimony. Also, do not research any information about this case, the law, or the people involved, including the parties, the witnesses, the lawyers, or the judge. This includes using the Internet to research events or people referenced in the trial. This case was tried on evidence presented in the courtroom. If you conduct independent research, you will be relying on matters not presented in court. The parties have a right to have this case decided on the evidence that they know about, and that has been introduced here in court. If you do research or investigation, or experiment that we do not know about, then your verdict may be influenced by inaccurate, incomplete, or misleading information that has not been tested by the trial process, including the oath to tell the truth, and by cross-examination. All of the parties are entitled to a fair trial, rendered by an impartial jury, and you must conduct yourself so as to maintain the integrity of the trial process. If you decide a case based on information not presented in court, you will have denied the parties a fair trial in accordance with the rules of this state, and you have done an injustice. It is very important that you abide by these rules. 41. I am submitting to you two verdict forms, one for each count. Each form contains the original charge and lesser included offenses. You shall only render one verdict on each count. When you have reached a unanimous verdict and complete the verdict forms, inform the court attendant. Verdict form number one, State of Iowa versus Cheyenne Harris. We, the jury, find the defendant, check one box, guilty of murder in the first degree. Guilty of murder in the second degree, guilty of involuntary manslaughter, not guilty, signature line for the four person. Verdict form count number two, we the jury find the defendant, check one box, guilty of child endangerment causing the death of a child, guilty of child endangerment causing serious injury to a child, guilty of child endangerment causing bodily injury to a child, guilty of child endangerment, not guilty, signature line for the four person. Mayor Lee, would you go get Barb, please? It's now time for counsel for each side to present their closing arguments or summations of the evidence. Counsel for the state will have the opening summation. Counsel for the defendant will then have an opportunity for reply, and since he will only address you once, will present the defendant's summation. Counsel for the state will then have a closing reply to the argument of the defendant. The lawyers will be commenting upon the evidence which has been presented during the trial. They will not intentionally mislead you. But if their recollection of the testimony is not the same as yours, you must follow your own recollection and rely on that. Summations and closing arguments of counsel are not evidence, and if the attorney's references to law are inconsistent with the court's written instructions, you must follow the written instructions. The summations and arguments are to help you understand the contentions of each side. Please give them your utmost attention. Ms. Timmons. May it please the court, counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on May 1st, 2017, the defendant was given a blessing, a baby boy, a healthy, happy, innocent baby boy. 
now that you have heard all of the evidence, it should be clear to you that the defendant didn't want the responsibility of that blessing, that she didn't accept the responsibility of that blessing, and that she let her blessing die a slow and painful and unnecessary death. And just as during Sterling's life, Sterling's life, when the defendant took no responsibility for him, it's the same in his death. That's why we're here, because she doesn't take responsibility for his death. Actions and consequences, that's what this is about. You, as the jury, will soon be in the position to decide what her actions were and what are the consequences. Is it guilty? Is it not guilty? At this time, I'm going to go through some of the evidence with you. This is my chance, the state's chance, to walk through the evidence, to apply the law that you've just heard from the judge, uh, and to, to make arguments about our case and as to what makes sense, as to what's reasonable. You're going to hear that word a lot this morning. Reasonable. The state has to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. It is our burden. We gladly take it on in every case. But remember what the definition for it is. If after a full and fair consideration of all of the evidence, you are firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, then you have no reasonable doubt and you should find the defendant guilty. Okay? Firmly convinced. It does not be, mean beyond all doubt. It does not mean beyond any doubt. It does not mean beyond a shadow of a doubt. Don't hold the state to a higher standard that we do not have to meet. Are you firmly convinced? What's reasonable? Anything is possible, ladies and gentlemen, but that doesn't mean it's reasonable. We talked about that in jury selection. Right? Just because somebody throws out another theory or a possibility, that doesn't make it true. That doesn't make it that there's doubt. You have to look at what's reasonable. And reasonable doubt is based upon reason and common sense. You get to use your common sense. It's the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act. Now be clear about that. Hesitation does not mean deliberation. When you go back in the jury room, you're going to talk to each other. You're going to discuss the facts. Some of you may disagree on things. You may go back and forth. That is not hesitation. That's deliberation. You are supposed to deliberate as a jury. You are supposed to go through that process. When it talks about this phrase of the kind of doubt that would make a reasonable person hesitate to act, that's when you get to the end conclusion. That's when you get to that point where you're saying guilty or not guilty. Okay, it's at that point that if you're hesitating, you don't know, you don't think that, that guilty is right, that's your hesitation, not deliberation. It's your job to deliberate. A reasonable doubt is one that fairly and naturally arises from the evidence or the lack of evidence. Now look at that phrase, fairly and naturally arises. You don't go looking for reasonable doubt. Based on reason and common sense, and it's not the mere possibility of innocence. You are truth seekers, not doubt seekers. There's two counts in this case. You've heard from the jury instructions that each one must be decided on its own merits. Now you also heard in the jury instructions that you do not have to agree on a fact or a theory. The only thing you have to agree on is the end conclusion of that. So if you get back in the jury room and someone says, well, I find that the particular acts that she did in this case are one, two, and three, and somebody else says, well, I find the particular acts that she did in this case are A, B, and C, it doesn't matter as long as you're still coming to the end conclusion that those acts make her guilty. Right? So you do not have to agree to all of the facts. It's just your verdict that you have to agree on. Consider evidence using your observations, your common sense, your experience. Again, you're seeing that word, common sense. 
try to reconcile any conflicts in the evidence, but if you cannot, you accept the evidence that you find more believable. Right? This isn't one of those things where you say, well, these two things conflict, so I'm just going to throw out my hands and walk away from it and not make a decision. If these two things conflict, then you ask yourself, which one's more reasonable? Which one's more believable? And that's where you go to. There are lesser included offenses in this case. With lesser included offenses, you start at the top. If you find the defendant guilty at the top, then don't bother going to the rest of them. So when you're reading the elements, the jury instructions for count one, murder in the first degree, and you go through those elements, and you have your deliberation, and you discuss it, and you all agree, guilty. Don't bother reading murder in the second degree involuntary manslaughter. You don't even have to go to those. Just move on to the second count. So you start at the top, and then you don't need to go any further if you make a guilty decision on that. So what are the elements of murder in the first degree? And keep in mind, the elements in the case, that jury instruction, murder in the first degree, that's the only thing the state has to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Each one of those elements. During the time frame, May 1st, 2017, through and including August 30th, 2017, the defendant killed Sterling Cohen. Sterling was under the age of 14. The defendant acted with malice of forethought. The defendant was committing the offense of child endangerment. And his death occurred under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to human life. This is what the state has to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's do the easiest element first, Sterling's age. We have to show that he was under the age of 14. We you all know that. Sterling's birthday is May 1st, 2017. On August 30th, 2017, Sterling was three months and 30 days old. Element number two is proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Nobody disputes this. It's that simple. That element is taken care of. Let's skip to element four. To prove murder in the first degree, we have to prove that the defendant committed child endangerment. Child endangerment has its own definitions to it. We have to show that she was a parent and that she intentionally committed an act or series of acts using torture or cruelty and the result to Sterling was bodily injury. Now keep this in mind. We do not have to prove that she intended bodily injury. All we prove is that she knew she was committing acts. She was aware of her acts. That her acts weren't an accident or a mistake. Right? That's the intentional part of it. The result of her acts was bodily injury. So, was she a parent? The parties have stipulated. DNA testing was done. There's no question. The defendant is the biological parent of Sterling Cohen. There's no dispute to that. Did she intentionally commit an act or series of acts using torture or cruelty? Okay, so let's break that down and first talk about what acts did she do? What acts did she commit in this case? The very first act, and you don't know when it happened. Okay, you don't know what day it was, what time of the day. But the very first act was when she chose to place him in that swing and face him towards the wall and walk out of that room and shut the door. That's her first act. It was a conscious decision on her part, and it continued over days, possibly over weeks, that he sat in that room. We don't know for sure when he went in there. We know the weekend of August 5th, her mother, the defendant's mother, said, well, he was a little thin, but he was okay. She took care of him that weekend. And after that, Sterling went home with the defendant. Did she, that particular day, put him in the room and leave him there? Did it take her a week before she put him in there? It doesn't matter, because we know he was put in there at some point 
during the month of August for an extended period of time. That act itself set off a chain of events that led to Sterling's death. What we also know is after that, thousands of acts occurred. Every minute, every hour of every day that Sterling sat in that room, the defendant committed acts. Every time that she chose to do something else besides care for her child was an act. It was a choice. Pick whichever one that you would like, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have to agree to them. <coughs> you saw the photographs of the crime scene and the apartment that they all lived in. Every time that she went and put a movie in for Nala, but didn't go back and feed her baby, that was an act. Every time she went to turn on the air conditioner that's in the living room, living room to keep themselves cool, while Sterling sat in the back room that was te felt 10 to 20 degrees hotter than the rest of the place, that was an act. Every time she sat herself on that couch to take a nap or to watch TV and didn't go and take care of her baby, that's an act. Every time she walked to the refrigerator and opened the door and fed herself and fed Nala, and fed Zach with all the food that they had in their refrigerator. Every time she did that and didn't feed her child, it was a choice, it was an act. Every time she was in that kitchen and did something else besides open up that covered door and mix the formula that was sitting right there and go feed her child, it was an act. Every time she walked into that bathroom, that a bathroom that has an adjoining wall to Sterling's room, every time she went in there and took a shower and chose not to wash Sterling, chose not to clean him and change his diaper, that was an act. It was a choice. Every time she went in that bathroom to put on her makeup, to do her hair, to get the dog shampoo out of there, to take care of the dog, it was an act. She chose not to go take care of Sterling. Every time she went in the bedroom to lay in her bed to sleep, every time she placed Nala in the playpen, Nala, who had a bed, who had blankets, who had toys, every time she placed Nala in that crib and didn't go take care of Sterling, didn't hold him, didn't change him, didn't feed him, that was an act. Every time she turned on that fan that's facing Nala's bed to keep her cool, but left him suffering in that back room, that was an act. Every time she started turning on the ceiling fan in the living room to keep her family cool and comfortable. While Sterling was dehydrating, while his organs were shutting down in that hot back room, every time she did that, that was an act. Every time she took a step in this tiny apartment and went somewhere else besides Sterling's bedroom to take care of him, it was an act. Her bedroom, you could take two steps from her bedroom and get right into Sterling's room. Her bedroom had an adjoining wall. This is a small apartment. She heard him scream. And she did nothing. How many days did he cry? Wanting food. Wanting hydration. Wanting to be touched. Wanting to be changed. Is that why the mattresses were propped up against the wall? To prevent some of that sound coming through? Is that why the door was always shut so she didn't have to hear it? As loud as it would be with the door open? How many times did she ignore those cries? Now, you know the cries stopped after a while because he was too ill. He was too frail. He didn't have the energy to cry anymore. But there was a time where Sterling cried and cried and cried and nobody took care of him. And every time she ignored that, that was a choice. It was an act. Now we have to look at where the act's intentional. Okay. 
Now, this is not in the sense of were the acts intentional with any type of specific intent. Okay. Like I said, the result is bodily the injury. We don't have to show that she intended physical harm to Stone. We just have to show she knew what she was doing. That's the only thing that you get to use Dr. O'Hara's testimony for. It was she aware of her actions. Were her actions not an accident? That's the only thing that you're considering. So how do we know that they were intentional? Because she knew Sterling was not being cared for. She knew every time she walked by his room and didn't go in there was a time that he wasn't being fed. It was a time that he wasn't being changed. Hey, you knew from Zach Cohen's testimony, he had nothing to do with Sterling. He didn't change diapers, he didn't go in that room, he didn't think Sterling was his, and he didn't care. Cheyenne was fully aware that she was the sole provider for Sterling, that she was the only person who could give Sterling the care that he needed, and she chose not to do it. She was aware that she was not doing that. She knew he needed help. Anyone who saw that child, who heard that child, who looked at that child during that time frame, would know that he needed help. You wouldn't even have to see him to know he needed help. Everybody knows, I don't care what level your education is, everybody knows a baby needs to be fed. A baby needs hydration. A baby needs a diaper change. Right? She knew he needed her help, and she knew he was dying. Because again, that's just common sense. If you don't feed your baby, they don't live. What you know from the evidence is that within a 26-day period, Sterling went from thin, maybe being underfed at that point, maybe not being taken care of very well, but still taken care of, to starting to death. Look at the last photo of Sterling. It was taken on July 15th, 2017, to the facial photo at the autopsy. Any person in that apartment would know that this child needed help, would know that their actions of doing other things and not helping Sterling is an action that's helping lead to his death. So did she intentionally commit a series of acts using torture or cruelty? Now again, the intentional part of this is not that she thought in her head, I'm going to be cruel, I'm going to torture my child, so I'm not going to feed him and I'm not going to change his diapers. That's not what we're talking about here. Was she aware that she was doing acts, leaving him in that room, not feeding him, not bathing him? And was the result of that torture or cruelty to Sterling? Right? There's no legal definition for these. You don't have a, a legal instruction on what these mean. So you use your common sense. Here's a common sense definition. Torture, infliction of pain, abuse, ill treatment, maltreatment. Seems relevant to this case. Cruelty, callous indifference to pain and suffering. So what did we have here? What evidence supports the torture and cruelty in this case? The photos and the testimony of the first responders. The state knows that those photos are not enjoyable to look at. But those photos show so many things in this case, and we'll talk about some of the other things later, but what, one of the things that they do show is the torture and cruelty of what Sterling had to endure during August of 2017. And the testimony of the first responders talking about what they saw, what they felt, and Dr. Klein and Dr. Hunton's testimony. So what do we have with these? The room was oppressively hot. Everyone said it. Now the temperature that they took, what, eight hours later in that room was 81 degrees. Everybody testified though. It felt much hotter than that. And you also know that at 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock in the afternoon, in August, when first responders got there, it was hotter 
than the temperature they took that evening. It was oppressively hot, not appropriate for anyone to be sitting in. No air. Tom Friedrich called the sheriff because something was not right. She didn't know any of the facts of the case. She didn't know who these people were, but when she got <coughs> in that room and she saw, saw Sterling, she knew immediately something was not right. The smell was so bad, Jason Russell had to hold his breath. Layers of soaked blankets and clothing around Sterling, a diaper full of sewage, exposed, raw skin, hunger and dehydration, never being touched or held. Think about that. You know, the things that are in our face in this case was that he starved, that he died of thirst, that he died of infection. But think about the fact that this baby, Sterling, was never touched or held. All babies need that. All human beings need that. And he sat in that room and he cried for someone to come get him. And he cried for someone to feed him. And all he needed was somebody to touch him and to pick him up and to bathe him and to love him and to care for him. And it never happened. Never touched her home during that time. Now how do you know that? Because of Dr. Huntington. Okay. The maggots would not have been there had he been moved. That's how you know that Sterling was never moved, never touched, despite the obvious diaper and, and those types of things. Dr. Huntington talked about the life cycle of the maggots, and one of the things the maggots do is when they're done feeding, they crawl away to pupate. And we found that in the blankets and on the swing. Uh, and you see that in the picture where the maggots started pupating. Had Sterling been moved, picked up, like she said she did the night before? Do you remember that? In her interview, she said that she changed his diaper the night before, picked him up. But had that happened, you wouldn't have seen this type of evidence where it was. You also know that these maggots were feeding on his feces and skin. They were crawling on his body. Had he been moved or touched? or bathed or anything during the life cycle of a maggot, none of that evidence would have been there. Dr. Huntington talked about the scuttlefly, how it's able to complete its life cycle in 9 to 13 days. This is where we get the time frame, right? Now you add a day because the fly has to get to that food source in the first place. So give that fly the time to get into the house, to get into the bedroom, to get into Sterling's diaper, to start feeding, you've got 10 to 14 days that we know that he sat there, not moving, not being touched, not being bathed, and who knows how often being fed, because you know it wasn't very much, and at the end it was probably nothing. And as he laid there, he had maggots crawling on his skin. Is that torture itself? Think about that. Being completely helpless, not being able to move, and having bugs crawling all over you while you're in pain from hunger and thirst, feeding on your feces and your dying skin. It's almost beyond imagination, the torture and the cruelty that that baby went through during the last few weeks of his life. And this all happened while he was still alive. You know, maybe some of you in the beginning of this case, when you heard maggots, you thought, well, they, you died and they left them in the swing for a long time, and that's why there's maggots. Well, you know now from the evidence, that's not the case. Okay? Dr. Klein said based on the Riger, Sterling could have been dead for up to eight hours. Maybe a day. Because had he been dead longer, he would have looked differently. He would have been bloated. The rider, he would have been stiff. It would have gone away by that point. Right? He had just died. Dr. Huntington talked about facultative my myiasis, infestation of the living. And that's what he saw in this case. Had Sterling been dead for an extended period of time, it would have been blowfly infestation, not scuttlefly 
infestation. He also would have seen the flies in Sterling's nose and his ears and things like that. It would have looked different. So Dr. Huntington can tell you from the insects that he was only dead a half day to a day. And the entire rest of that time, he was alive, going through a painful, horrendous death while two adults were in another room. It, this was torture. This was cruel. There's absolutely no question about this. The defendant's intentional act or series of acts of torture and cruelty resulted in bodily injury. Well, of course it resulted in bodily injury. Injury Sterling died. Okay, bodily injury is any physical pain, illness, or impairment. If somebody hits you and you say, ouch, that's bodily injury. So again, there's no question on this. There's no need to discuss it any further. So element four, child endangerment, is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Element one, death. Sterling died. If the defendant's actions caused or directly contributed to Sterling's death, then the defendant killed Sterling. All right, this case is a little different than some murder, most murder cases we do. This isn't someone picking up a gun and pulling a bullet, putting a bullet through somebody's head. This isn't someone uh, in, a, in a moment of rage taking their baby and, and shaking them, causing brain damage, and they die. All right, this is an extended period of time, but her actions still caused and directly contributed to Sterling's death. But for her actions, she would, he would be alive today. Every time she chose to do something else besides care for Sterling was an act that caused or directly contributed to Sterling's death. And she put him in that room and faced him towards that wall and she walked out and she shut the door. That was an act that caused or directly contributed to Sterling's death. There are two adults in that part, apartment. Both of those adults had the moral and legal duty to care for Sterling. And neither one of them took it on. Okay. The defendant is not excused from this responsibility because she was too tired, or she wasn't feeling well, or she supposedly had depression, or because she chose to do drugs. She does not get excused from this because of her choices. Element one, she is responsible for his death. Now, element three, malice of forethought. Malice is a state of mind which leads one to intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of another out of actual hatred or with an evil purpose or with an unlawful purpose. You see that you have alternatives here. Again, you don't have to agree on which one you pick, but if you pick one and everybody agrees that's malice, then you're fine. Malice may be found from an actual hatred or by a fixed or deliberate intent to do injury. Malice may be found from the acts and conduct of the defendant and the means used in doing the wrongful and injurious acts. And it doesn't have to exist for any length of time. Did the Let's break it down. Did the defendant intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of Sterling out of actual hatred? That's one of the alternatives. Well, she told Dr. Denner Sterling was the reason her family was messed up. And she blamed him. For their problems. Zach didn't believe Sterling was his son, and he had nothing to do with him. And you saw from the evidence what you heard about her history, she always left her family for Zach. He came first, always. Sterling was interfering with her relationship, her happiness, her life. So at that time, did she have an actual hatred for Sterling? Is it unreasonable to think that with what she did? Another alternative, does she intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of Sterling with an evil or an unlawful purpose? What else do you call what happened to Sterling? Anything but evil. 
How can her allowing Sterling to die an extended painful death in her own home where she had things to take care of and everything she needed to take care of them because she couldn't leave out in the feeding or bathing or changing diapers or changing clothes or because she wanted to please Zach because she wanted things to go back the way they were before Sterling was born. How could that be anything but unlawful or evil? We have child endangerment laws for a reason. We, we put laws on the books to protect children because they cannot protect themselves. We all have a duty to take care of our children. Sometimes we have a duty to take care of other people's children because they cannot take care of themselves, especially when it's an infant. Right? Everything that she did with him is unlawful. You may also find malice from the acts, conduct, and means used in doing the wrongful and injurious acts. This is also why we showed you the pictures. These photographs scream malice. One of the things that they show is the nature of the injuries. Like, what did her acts cause? They caused this. Sterling was a healthy baby, and by August of 2017, look at his ribs. Look at his skin and the pain that he went through. Those are malicious acts to let a child end up like that. He died of starvation. You know, Dr. Klein calls it malnutrition, and it's a much nicer word, but he died of starvation. He gained five and a half ounces from birth to death. And you've seen some of the pictures in between where he had the chubby cheeks. He had put on weight. Okay, so that extreme weight loss came at the end when she chose not to feed him anymore. Dehydration, he died of thirst. His sunken eyes, his sunken face, the soft spot on his head was sunken. His whole body was shutting down because he wasn't receiving the hydration that he needed just to survive. Infection, he died of diaper rash. He died of diaper rash in a room that had clean diapers in a room that had A&D ointment on the floor, with a baby bag, with diapers, with clean clothes. That's malicious. So that's the nature of the injuries. That's one way that you can find from the acts and the conduct, the malice. But you can also look at the mechanism of injury, the denial of critical care. Sterling was in a house that had formula. He was in a house that had running water and a bathtub. A bathtub that had bath toys in it for Nala. Because she got baths, but Sterling didn't. He was in a room that had everything a baby needed. A clean bouncy swing, a clean blanket, baby bags, wipes, diapers, ointment. All of those things. But none of them were used. Denial of critical care. It's malicious. Here's the other thing to think about. She denied Sterling critical care. Okay? She made these choices to not do what she needed to do to keep him alive. But she made the effort to use her resources in that house to cover up the mess. Sterling is sitting in a swing that is soaked with urine and feces, probably dripping down to the floor. And what does she do? She starts stuffing clothing in a swing to soak it up. Isn't that reasonable as to why that clothing was there? There was onesies that could have been put on him to keep him clean. Instead, it was put in a swing to soak up urine. Blankets, feeties, the little mittens, a jacket. She took the time to do that, but she couldn't take the time to go fix a bottle 
The smell in the room was horrendous. Instead of cleaning it up, instead of changing Sterling, she put air fresheners underneath his swing. Now they had some questions about, well, you don't know who put in there. It could have been Nala. Maybe she was praying with them. Well, you heard from Zach King's testimony, and you got if you want, that Cheyenne didn't put them there because she didn't put them back. But you also know from the evidence that Nala did not go into that room. Okay, the princess wasn't allowed in that room. That's why the door was shut. Nala lived a completely separate life from Sterling. The defendant put those there because the smell was too bad. Now, was that to cover it up so maybe Zach didn't notice, so maybe the neighbors didn't notice? <coughs> or was that to cover it up for when she did walk in there and she didn't like the smell for her own convenience? Don't know. But she made all of this effort to cover up the mess instead of just cleaning up the mess and taking care of her child. That's malicious. That's malice. So we've talked about the nature of injuries, the mechanism of injury. The other thing is, Sterling's a child. He's three months and 30 days old. He could not care for himself. He could not protect himself. And that's who she chose to do this to. A completely helpless, innocent human being. That's who she chose to do this to. That's malicious. Here's the easiest way to deal with malice. You can infer from the commission of child endangerment causing death that there was malice. So basically what that means is if you find that she committed count two, then you can have an inference. You can say that if she committed this particular crime, then she had to have had malice in this particular crime. Why? Because to have committed child endangerment causing death, it's just a given. You have to have malice to do that type of crime. So they will allow you to make this very simple inference. It's that simple. So malice, element three, whichever way you go with it is proven beyond the reasonable doubt. Element five, extreme indifference to human life. Sterling's death occurred under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to human life. This is a common sense definition. There's no legal definition for it. There's really not much need to talk about this because everything that we have gone through has shown that extreme indifference to human life. Sterling dying over a 10 to 14, at least a 10 to 14 day period in a swing, not being touched, not being fed, not being clothed with clothes that were sitting there in the room, not having a clean bouncy seat that was sitting there right beside him. Everything that happened to him, everything that she did was an extreme indifference to human life. These were not acts of careless neglect. These were not an accident. These were, no, these were acts that no child should ever have to endure. And think about what he was experiencing the last few weeks of his life. The pain, the hunger, his organs shutting down, the bugs crawling on him, the crying. We don't know how babies' thought processes are, but we know they feel pain. We know when they need something, they ask us for it. These circumstances were extreme, they were indifferent, and they were in complete disregard of human life. No human should ever have to experience what Sterling did. So count two. That's count one. Murder in the first degree. Guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Count two. Child endangerment resulting in death or causing death. What the state has to show, the elements for this. The defendant was the parent of Sterling. Sterling was under the age of 14 years. The defendant willfully deprived Sterling of the necessary food, water, health care, or supervision appropriate for a child of Sterling's age. The defendant was reasonably able to provide those things. And as a result, Sterling suffered substantial physical harm 
and as a result, Sterling died. Now, willful deprivation. That's the one that's different than what we saw in some of the elements of murder first. But you still go back to the previous arguments that were just made. Okay? She told her own doctor she was tired of changing diapers. She was tired of hearing him cry. Any person who lived with Sterling would know that he desperately needed help. You know, she tried to claim in her interview that Sterling was fine the last few days of his life. That is not credible. You know that is not true. Okay? Element three is proven beyond a reasonable doubt. She made willful, conscious choices to not provide care to him. And was she reasonably able to provide that care? Absolutely. There was plenty of food in the refrigerator. She had water in her sink, in her bathtub. She had formula, bottles, diapers, wipes, clean clothes, ointment in the house. Everything was there. She had access to health care through Title 19. All she had to do was pick him up out of that swing and take him to the hospital. At some point during that time, Did she not want to do that because she let it go too far? She knew he looked too sick. She knew they were going to blame her for it. So she just left him in there trying to cover up what she did. She went to the grocery store on August 26th. She had access to a car to go into the groceries. Her kitchen was full with chocolate milk and snacks for Nala and pop and chips. She was reason reasonably able to to provide. They could afford a dog. Think, think about that when you look at those crime scene photos. There is a half a bag of dog food sitting in that house. And a dog that was fed and well cared for. While Sterling lay rotting in that back room. They could afford drugs. Right? They had plenty of money for that. They earned $45,000 a year. Their rent was $330 a month. Sure they had debts. Don't we all? That doesn't excuse not providing for him. And, and there's no evidence to show that they could not, she could not reasonably provide for his care. She knew how to care for a child. Nala was living proof of that. Nala, she raised Nala from an infant. She had her when she was a baby. She changed her diapers. She gave her bottles. And you heard during the interview how much she talked about Nala and all the things that she did with her as a baby. Because she knew how to care for a child. In her interview with Callaway, she described where the formula and the baby food were kept. She knew that. She de described how much formula was in the can. She knew how much formula was in that can. She described how she mixed the formula. She described how Sterling would get louder when she wanted fruit food. So she admitted she could hear him. She knew what he wanted when he cried. She was reasonably able to care for him. She described how she changed Nala's diaper the morning of August 30th. In her interview, she talked about how she had gotten up and changed Nala's diaper and put on a new diaper. She knows how to change diapers. <clears throat> reasonably able to provide. She said that she knew when Sterling was uncomfortable because he would fuss. And then she said that's pretty much all he could do. So she fully recognized the fact that he was wholly dependent on her. And she, could reason, she was reasonably able to provide. Elements five and six in this, in the child endangerment, it's the same discussion that we had for causing the death in count one. This was homicide, death at the hands of another, denial of critical care. It was death at the hands of his own mother. <coughs> Elements five and six proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Death occurred substantial physical harm. So did the defendant commit murder in the first degree, ladies and gentlemen? The defendant killed Sterling. Sterling was three months old. She acted with malice forethought. She was committing the offense of child endangerment. His death occurred under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to human life. Therefore, she is guilty of murder in the first degree. 
Did she commit child endangerment causing death? The defendant was the parent of Sterling. Sterling was three months old. The defendant willfully deprived Sterling of the necessary food, water, health, care, or supervision. The defendant was reasonably able to provide those things, and as a result, Sterling suffered substantial physical harm. As a result, Sterling died. Therefore, the defendant is guilty of child endangerment causing death. It's that simple. Thank you for your time and attention. Mr. Harbaker, do you want the lights up? Yes, please. Can we leave the lights up, please? Mr. Harbaker.
some of it was put up on that wall for you to look at. The entirety of that instruction is before you. And one thing you must understand is there is no such thing as murder in the state of Iowa in the absence of malice. It is the only crime that requires it. And the reason we required it is because we singled that out, that state of mind, that depraved state of mind for those particular people. That instruction says that malice is a state of mind which leads one to intentionally do a wrongful act to the injury of another. And then it describes the hatred that you have to have. Then it describes the evil that you have to have. And then it describes not something just unlawful, but with an unlawful purpose purposeful. Where's the evil, the specific, that, that mindset, that state of mind? Where's the state of mind of hatred? Where's the state of mind of that purpose? It does not exist. It does not exist. There's no proof of it. It's conjecture. And it starts from the very beginning of this case, which is you put up a horrible picture of a young child and you want that emotional response to overwhelm logic. But in Iowa, there's a crime for that. That's the child and David one. It's not murder. There's no proof of malice. The last paragraph of that instruction that's before you says, Malice of forethought is a fixed purpose or design to do that harm. A fixed purpose or design. There is no proof of a fixed purpose or design for this happening. Yes, malice can be inferred by the commission of child endangerment, but it doesn't have to be. Instruction number 19 says malice may, but need not be inferred. And the reason that need not be inferred is there is because there are forms of child endangerment where there is no malice. If so, why even have the malice in there? Because all we have to do is prove child endangerment. But it's a recognition that there are certain things that can lead to a child's death that are not malicious, like the willful deprivation of critical care. Willful deprivation of critical care. The other thing to be aware of in these rules is that there are two forms of child endangerment that we're talking about in this one. One is the one that the state's attempting to prove to get you to first degree murder. The second is the one in count two. The first one requires the use of torture. Requires the use of cruelty. Use. Act towards. Sterling. Requires the use. The second one, which is more appropriate for this case, says the defendant willfully deprived. And you can stand up and talk about every time they turn on the TV, every time you turn on the fan, every time they open the door and say, that's an act, that's an act, that's an act. And it's equally true that every time that happened, it was the willful deprivation of that care. Was it an act towards Sterling? No. It was a willful deprivation of that care, which is child endangerment causing death. Miss Harris had a fixed purpose for design. If Miss Harris had the evil and the hatred that is required for there to be a murder, beginning on May 1st and ending on August 30th, there would have never been a need for a babysitter. There would have never been a need for a notebook. There would have never been a need for going to watch the gates. None of that would have happened. She had complete control over Sterling. She and Zach Cohen. He didn't have to take him to anything. He could have just died. And it could have happened earlier. But at that time, and at no time, is it proven that she had a fixed purpose or design to kill Sterling. And if, and this is the odd one, a hard one to wrap your head around. If she had that fixed purpose and design, if she had that desire to have Sterling dead, 
and was not simply just willfully depriving him of the food, why on earth, during the week that Sterling is found dead, on that Wednesday, was she making plans with her mother to take both the children? That week. What that shows you, folks, is that it's not evil. It's not hatred. She was ill. Because that's the reason. So we all know the status of Sterling at that. We all know the status. That's delusion. Based on our uh, off the record discussion, Mr. Hobbaker, let's just move on. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Otherwise, all the activities that happened uh, in May, and June, and July, and the activities of babysitters and notebook and things like that make no sense. Make no sense. Nala, the fact that she at least was fed is easily explained by the testimony of Dr. Klein and also the testimony of Dr. O'Hara and ultimately just by common sense. It makes sense that obviously Sterling only had one mechanism to attempt to survive, whereas Nala had the ability to approach her mother, to be demanding on her, to make sure that those needs were met. But have no illusion that the condition of that household was some sort of pristine and wonderful family environment. They were only in that apartment for just a little bit. You can look at the condition of it. It's not no great chicks. The status of the furniture and what little food they had in there isn't really something that you're going to find in most households. So this was not a wonderful environment. It was shown by Dr. O'Hara. was not of the belief that Nala was necessarily in wonderful condition, if not physically, mentally. So the fact that she is here does not prove or turn the issue that it must have been some sort of focused attention on Sterling when there are really no facts to support that. What's important is the idea that Miss Harris is not taking responsibility. That is not true. That is not true. When she was interviewed by Dr. Denner and by Dr. O'Hara, both of them, she's incarcerated, both of them, she's reflective, and at that point, described as sober now, and no longer suffering from that major depressive episode that happened in August of 2017. She looks back at what was happening in that era and realizes I was really messed up. I was really messed up. And we are not disputing that. She was really messed up. And because she was really messed up, and because of the choices that she made, because she did willfully deprive Sterling of critical care, we are not arguing that. The facts of this case support a conviction for count two read it. It's exactly what happened in this case. We accept responsibility for that conviction. That's what happened. When people know that they've done wrong, they like to feel that there's been a balance, that they paid for what the wrong they did. We accept the conviction for count two. The reason that we're here, and the reason that we've take, taken a week, week and a half out of your life, is because it is not murder. The acceptance of responsibility requires, and Ms. Harris accepts, the conviction for child endangerment causing death. Justice, the finding of truth, requires the finding of not guilty for murder in the first degree. Because there is no murder without malice.
The other thing is, malice can be found at any time during this time frame, for any length of time during this time frame. Don't be confused that we have to show malice, malice existed every day, every minute, every hour for this entire time frame of Sterling's life. It can last for a second. It can last for a day. It can last for two whole weeks while Sterling's sitting in that room. And let's also be clear that the defendant's mental health only goes towards whether or not she had the general intent to commit the crime. Whether or not she committed the acts in a knowing and voluntary manner. And it wasn't an accident. It wasn't by mistake. But you know there's no accidents or mistakes in this case. You don't accidentally leave your baby in the room for two weeks and not feed them. First degree murder is reserved for the most horrendous deaths. That's why we're here. How much more horrendous does it get than this? So what do you find reasonable? Just because they've thrown out that she's depressed, she can't have malice, She's sorry it happened, she didn't mean for it to happen. Just because that's thrown out there doesn't change the truth. It doesn't change what you know from the evidence. And you have to decide the facts from the evidence. And you try to reconcile any conflicts, and if you can't, then you pick what you find more believable. You have to make a decision. So is it reasonable to believe that she was so severely depressed that she was completely incapable of taking care of her son for at least 10 to 14 days when she was able to feed, bathe, and clothe Nala. Nala should have an exhibit sticker on her head. She should be exhibit number one. Right? Nala is the reason that you know that this 
claim of I'm not capable of taking care of Sterling because I'm depressed and because I use drugs is not true. She took care of Nala. Now, they want to say, well, Nala was older. She could climb on her. She could, she could pull on her. She could get her attention. Yeah, a baby screaming is very demanding. That gets your attention. A, a filthy, stinking room gets your attention. And guess what? She chose to put Sterling out of her presence so she didn't have to pay attention to him. Her choice, her act. She was able to drive to the grocery store. She bought groceries for her family four days prior. Is that someone who's just so depressed they can't even function? They don't know what they're doing? She got milk, chocolate milk, pop, chips. She was able to Facebook, Instagram, text. She's posting about fashion and her dog on Facebook while Sterling is dying in the back room. Is that someone who's so depressed that she doesn't know what she's doing? She's able to clean the house. She was able to get rid of the dog. She put Nala in a pre-dress before the police arrived. Did you catch those time frames? There was a length of time when they found Sterling dead before they called the police. Why? They probably had to get the drugs out of the house. They had to get the dog out of the house because they weren't supposed to have him. They put Nala in a nice dress. They wanted to look like a good family so their story sounded good. Is that someone who's so depressed they didn't know what they did? Is it reasonable to believe that she was so depressed when she's able to normally carry on over a two-hour interview after finding Sterling? Remember that. Dr. Denner told you that. That interview, listen to it again if you want. We have a clean computer. You can take it back to the jury room. You can listen to it again if you need to. But that interview and how she acted and how she spoke is one of the best indicators of who she was and what her mental state was at the time. And when you listen to that interview, you hear a lot of interesting things that clearly show she was aware of what she was doing. She provided her phone number. She provided her life history, where she grew up who her family was. She provided detail upon detail of her child care. Now, if you remember during that interview, you may not have picked it up at the time, but if you listen to it again, you will find that she constantly talked about Nala. I mean, you could see the preference she had for Nala in that interview alone. Because every time she was asked something about Sterling, she would describe started to describe Sterling's birth, but then she spent a page and a half of that transcript talking about Nala's birth and was excited about it and she loved Nala. Remember she said Nala's such a smart little girl, she could write a book. She's daddy's little girl. She could give every detail of what happened prior to Sterling being found, down to the times of when she got up, of when Zach got home, and they had grilled cheese. If someone has such an awful mental condition that they don't even know that they're not feeding their child, could they have this type of interview? And that's just common sense. <coughs> Is it reasonable to believe that she was so severely depressed that she was able to be dishonest with people? I want you to think about this very closely. They want you to believe that when she told their doctor and our doctor about her depression issues and how she was feeling during that time and, and the types of things that she was experiencing, they want you to believe all of that, right? And their own doctor said, we had to take what she said as true to make the diagnosis. Okay, but here's what you know from the evidence. She was dishonest with Tina Shatter. She's one of the first responders at that house, and she's already telling a story to cover up what she did, to protect herself. But she told Tina she fed him 9.30 the night before. You know that's not true. She was dishonest with Reed Caleb. She told him that she gave Sterling regular feedings, four-ounce bottles. No problems at all with them. He died of SIDS. You know that's not true. She was dishonest. She was protecting herself. She was dishonest with Agent Calloway, trying to deflect anything that had to do with improper care. She, when Agent Turbot pulled up at the library in Osage just a few days later, she tried to drive away from him. 
right? She had the wherewithal to think about that to protect herself, but they want you to believe she didn't have the wherewithal to take care of Sterling. She told Zach, see, I told you we should have taken Nala and Leo and Run. She knew that she should have gotten out of town because she knew what she did, she knew she was responsible for it, and she didn't want to accept the consequences for her actions. She was dishonest with Sheila Schrader. She told her she faced Sterling every three days and that the last days of his life were normal. Dishonest. Is it reasonable to believe that she had no idea that Sterling was cared for? That she was in such a mental state, such a depression, such a drug use? That she didn't have the basic knowledge of what was going on in her home? Is it reasonable to believe that any excuse she has provided to you can justify what happened to Sterling? Is it reasonable to believe that she has no responsibility for the health and safety of her child? Or, or is it more reasonable to believe that she really was just tired of changing diapers? Is it more reasonable to believe that she really was just tired of hearing him cry? Is it more reasonable to believe that she didn't want anything to do with Sterling? That she blamed Sterling because he was the reason her family was messed up? No, obviously this is not logical thinking. But that doesn't mean that it's thinking that changes that she knew what she was doing at the time. Okay? It's not okay, it's not right. But if that's how she felt, and you know that's how she felt, because she acted on those feelings. Is it more reasonable to believe that Zach wanted nothing to do with Sterling? And she just wanted to please Zach. She wanted Zach to come home from work and not see Sterling. She wanted him to be able to play with Nala and to see her and to pretend that they didn't have that baby boy that he didn't think was his, that he didn't want. She knew what she did, she knew what was wrong, she covered up her actions, and she attempted to deceive others to protect herself. She clearly had the mental functioning to know exactly what she was doing. She just didn't want to accept the consequences for her actions. Is it reasonable for her to not be held responsible for her actions merely because she now claims that looking back, she shouldn't have felt that way about Sterling. All right, how many of us have felt that way? I mean, use your life experience and your common sense. And whether it be something that you did as a parent with your child, or maybe it was a relationship that you were in and that you stayed in too long or shouldn't have gotten in the first place. How many times in people's lives do you look back at something and say, wow, I can't believe I thought that way at the time. Why did I continue to do that? I wouldn't do that now. I wish I had that. It doesn't excuse what you did at the time. You're still responsible for what you did. You still chose that person to be with in that relationship. And you chose to stay in that relationship. And it's very easy to say a year down the road that you should have got out a lot sooner. But it doesn't make you less responsible for it. This is not some split second decision or a mistake or an accident. This wasn't, I put my baby in the bathtub and I was so tired and I'd been so depressed and I walked out of the room and I forgot she was in there and, and she drowned. Okay, this wasn't, I had my kids in the car and my infant child was sleeping and my other two kids were screaming and we went into the grocery store and, and I forgot my baby in the car and I, I've been depressed and I haven't been thinking right and I haven't been sleeping and it was an accident. That is not what we're talking about. This is, I put my baby in the back room and for two weeks I chose not to change him, feed him, hydrate him, love him, Nothing. Knowing all the while that he's there. There's no mistake or accident here. That's the only thing that her mental health goes to. Was this a mistake or an accident? Did she generally not know what was going on? Her actions were continuous and consistent over a long period of time. 
So when you're looking at what's reasonable, you have to look at what's credible. Who do you find credible in this case? Now there's no dispute to Sterling's death. Okay, the crime scene testimony is unrefuted. Dr. Klein's testimony is unrefuted. Dr. Huntington's testimony is unrefuted. The only dispute is whether the defendant is responsible. Do you find her responsible for what happened to Sterling? She claims she's not, and she's provided you with reasons why. So do you find her credible? What you find reasonable is directly linked to who you find credible. The truth never changes. Her story still. All right, she told Agent Calloway that she tried him, okay, but she was dishonest about that because you know that she used meth a lot, all the time. She told Agent Calloway, never had meth in the house, not around the kids. Well, no, that's not true either because Jordan Clark testified about going over there on at least two occasions and doing meth with the kids in the house. She told Agent Calloway the dog was at a friend's house. The dog didn't stay there. Her baby just died. She is being interviewed by a DCI agent. And she is more concerned about covering up her dog and her meth use than actually finding out what's wrong with her baby. And what does that tell you? She knew what was wrong with her baby. She knew that she was responsible. She told Agent Calloway she fed Sterling three to four times a day, every day. Not true. She took Sterling out of the swing the night before and changed his bed over. Not true. She gave him a bottle the night before. Not true. She told Reed Palin he was crying the morning of the 30th. Absolutely not true. You know that from the evidence. She told Sheila Schrader she bathed Sterling every three days. Not true. Told Tina Shattuck he was fine when she fed him the night before at 9.30. Not true. She was not honest with any of those people. People who were there to help her find out what happened to the baby. Well, she didn't need that help because she knew what happened to the baby. And the only thing that she did was be dishonest with them so she could protect herself and cover up what she did. So why would you believe that she's being honest about her mental health with the doctors over a year and a half while she's facing criminal charges? Okay, Dr. O'Hara's opinion is largely based on the assumption that what defendant told him was true. She had everything to gain by what she said to him and nothing to lose. Do you find her credible? And do you find your, your statements to him so credible that it excuses this? That what happened to him is not malicious? That she didn't know what she was doing, which in turn made Sterling end up like this? Do you find that credible? And what about the mental health? The diagnoses do not matter. Now, it, it was said in the defense's closing that basically the doctors agreed. Well, the doctors didn't agree so much. Dr. Denner was pretty clear that if she had this, this global, systematic, severe depression, it would have looked different. But what Dr. Denner said, even if she had those things, she had depression, PTSD, addiction, there's nothing in the facts of this case that showed that it affected her ability to care for a child or that made her incapable of caring for her child. You have to look at the facts of the case. The diagnoses would have also would have shown this global and persistent behavior that would have affected all aspects of her life, not just Sterling. That's why now is so important. There's a happy, healthy baby girl in that house while her baby boy lay rotting in the back room. Depression doesn't work that way. You don't pick and choose like that. Dr. Denner said she was not so severely impaired that she could, with, without not knowing, allow her infant son to start to death without being aware of it. Okay, so who do you find more credible? And more importantly, you didn't need a doctor to tell you that. That's just common sense. You saw it from the evidence. The state 
does not have to prove to you why she did this. Okay. We absolutely do not have to prove to you why. Did she commit a particular action? Did she know she was doing that? It wasn't a mistake or an accident? Was, was it malicious? Did Sterling end up dead? That's what we have to prove to you. We don't have to prove why. Right? Could it be because she didn't want him in the first place? Could be. Could it be her only care was pleasing Zach? Could be. Could it be that she wanted out of that apartment? She wanted back on the road with Zach and all, and Sterling was getting in the way of that? Could be. But the point is, it doesn't matter. All of those would be reasonable inference, inferences, but the why doesn't matter. And does it change anything? You know, we have a lot of tragic things happen in our society. You know, hear about people walking into elementaries and, and, and shooting children and movie theaters and killing people and all of that. But does it really matter when that person walked in there and did what they did? And, and opened fire on our young children. Do you, is, do you really care why? It's interesting. We like to know it, but it doesn't change what happened. And it doesn't change what it did. And in this case, it, the why doesn't change what she did. It doesn't matter. The other thing is, this didn't just happen out of the blue. It's not like there was some instantaneous break with reality in the month of August. You saw this early on. Remember some of the evidence you heard about? Her disinterest, her dislike, her distaste of Sterling was, was earlier in the evidence, since June. Jennifer Schrieber said she never saw her outside with the baby. Remember she talked about the first time she met the defendant was at the gas station. Now she introduced herself to the defendant because she had saw her at the apartment complex. And the only time she had saw her at the complex was when she was outside with a little girl. Never with a baby. All right, so even at that time, she wasn't spending a lot of time with Sterling. Since June, everyone who saw Sterling said he was thin. All right, he wasn't being completely deprived, but he wasn't fattening up like any baby should. He probably wasn't being fed, fed the amounts that he should. Jordan Clark, he was in their apartment at least two times doing math with the defendant while Sterling was <coughs> in the back room and he had no idea they had a baby. They, they had Nala. He watched the defendant play with Nala. He said that she seemed so happy with Nala. Didn't even know there was a baby there. He told Callaway that they were trying to get Nala Nala potty trained, so she and Nala could go back on the road with Zach. Right, she said that during the interview, that they'd been working on that, getting Nala potty trained so they could go back on the road. No mention of Sterling. Remember how she spoke of Sterling during the interview? Compare that how she spoke about Nala. We talked about that earlier, earlier and she clearly disconnected herself from Sterling. Do you remember during the interview when she talked about her childbirth of Sterling at home at a friend's house in the bathtub. All right, this is supposed to be one of the most beautiful, wonderful things that a, a woman can go through. It's having her baby painful, yes. Discomfort, of course. But think about that experience of having your own child. And also keep in mind that when she's talking about this experience, she just found her child dead in her house. But how does she describe having Sterling? She says, I go to stand up and there's an effing bulge, and I'm like, oh my god, there's an effing head. That's how she talks about Sterling. Just a few hours after he's found dead. Do you think there's a disconnect there? That she had shut the door a long time ago and she was done with him? These are not the words or demeanor of a grieving mother who just lost her own son. Okay, it happened, the why it doesn't matter, and none of you will ever know exactly why this happened. You could stay up for nights 
for weeks, for months, trying to figure out how another human being can do this to a child. But you're never going to find yourself a good answer. And the only thing you're going to do is lose sleep. Okay? The why doesn't matter. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is your duty as jurors in this case to seek the truth and to do justice. It says that in your jury instructions. It is your duty to do that. And you know what the truth tells you in this case? The truth tells you that that woman, that her baby, rot in that back room. That she chose to do that. That she was fully capable of preventing his death. Fully capable of feeding him, changing him. She could have picked him up and dropped him off at the fire station steps in Alta Vista. She could have dropped him off at the hospital, let somebody else take care of Sterling, but she didn't. She left him there to rot. There are no words that can be said to adequately describe what happened to Sterling. There are no words that can do any justice to the pain and the suffering that he went through. I, I can't give you the words to make any of this better. I don't have any of the words to make this right. There is nothing that any of us can do to bring Sterling back. But you do have the words to do justice in this case. And your words are simple, and they're easy. And they are clearly meant for this case for both counts. Your words can tell the defendant in this case that she failed miserably as a mother and as a human being. Your words cannot bring Sterling back, but your words can do justice. And your words can tell this defendant that she is responsible and that there are consequences to what she did. And the words, ladies and gentlemen, are guilty. Guilty of murder in the first degree. Guilty of child endangerment causing death. It's that simple. Thank you.